is Matthew Wayne Selznick. And this is Sonatotem, episode 77. Hello, my friends. On this and every episode of Sonatotem, we talk about making stuff, finding success as we each define it, and staying healthy and sane in the process. Who am I to be discussing such things with you? Well, I have been an independent creator, well, since the last century, friends. Um, in terms of the electronic media, in terms of self-publishing as we know it today, I've been at it since 2005. I've been a podcaster since 2004. And my day job is helping other authors, podcasters, and other creators bring their works to fruition, to market, and to an audience. My approach to all of this, because it's all always changing, is hopefully that of an experienced beginner. And as I learn things, discover things, make mistakes, have triumphs, I try to share that with you here in the show. Every other episode, such as this one, I invite another creator, usually an author, to sit down in conversation. And today we are going to be talking to Rhiannon Held. Now, Rhiannon is the author of the Silver series of urban fantasy novels published by Tor. As R.Z. Held, she writes the Amsterdam Institute series of space opera novellas. Her short fiction, also written under R.Z. Held, has appeared in Beneath Ceaseless Skies. She lives near Seattle, where she works as an archaeologist for an environmental compliance firm. At work, she mostly uses her degree for copy editing, technical reports. In writing, she uses it for cultural world building, which we're going to get into. And in public, she says she'll probably be using it to check the mold seams on the wine bottle at dinner. You can find all of her stuff at rhiannonheld.com. And now, you know, normally I begin every episode of Sonatotem giving you an overview of what I've been up to in my own creative life in the previous week since the last episode. However, my conversation with Rhiannon Held was so chock full of good content that in the interest of not having this episode go on forever and ever, I just kind of want to get right into it. So here's my conversation with author Rhiannon Held. <laughs> I like to start these conversations with a very simple question that I hope kind of gets to the core of things right away. What is it that you make? I am somebody who does both novels and short fiction. And I'm a little bit, I feel like a car in that they have speeds that they're sort of comfortable at, that even without cruise control, many car engines will sort of like say 35 miles per hour on the freeway kind of fall into that and you don't need a lot of extra acceleration to keep it there. So I feel like my falling into it on the freeway kind of speed is novellas, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so sort of say between 15,000 words to 30,000 words, which I think gets novelette too, if we're being you know super specific about the categories for awards. So I feel like what I make is different stories within that. And some are longer and some are shorter. And as I've gone on, I've fallen more into creating short stories that connect to each other a little bit. In the beginning, I did a little bit more of like each one is its own world, its own characters, its own this, its own that. And now I've gone more into the feeling of probably these are happening at different places within the same world. But I do have some series that I do my novels within. Those are their own worlds. Do the shorter works that are connected, is there overlap with the novel series as well? Not so far. There's one world that I love to play in, and maybe we'll get into it as we go along um, mm -hmm. because of my uh, professional day job background. Mm -hmm. That's why I like to play in it. There is a novel in that, but it still needs sort of like its final revision, getting it ready for prime time kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so that would be more in the future that 
you would see that and then maybe see the links back to the the different short stories that have have been published. Okay. I, and I do want to talk more about that sort of personal creative franchise, that sort of story world based approach. But first, in 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 the spirit of every good four year old, <laughs> you've talked about what you create. So why do you create? Oh boy. That's a fun question. <laughs> um, well, I'll start it with, um, I have a different sort of path to, to creation, I think, than some people. Having listened to other writers in particular, often they can begin quite early in their life um, as sort of like, oh, well, I was telling stories or I wrote my first novel when I was four years old or three years old or whatever. And I don't feel like I was actually properly writing until I was probably 15 or 16 years old, assignments in, in elementary school, sort of high school aside. But looking back, I do see that I had stories in my head, probably at all times, but it was just later for me to think about writing them down. But having sort of, I think, forged that link between the sort of upswelling of creative energy in myself and knowing that I can then harness that and share it with people through writing. I don't think I could stop <laughs> at this point. When I was first traditionally published, a common interview question was, in your journey to get to this point, have you ever considered just stopping writing entirely? Or have you stopped at any point? Like, did you have any sort of interregnums in your writing career? And at that point, um, admittedly, my first novel was traditionally published reasonably young. I was 26. My answer was no, <laughs> I hadn't ever had that sort of interruption. And it was very much sort of the, the feeling that I will always have ideas and maybe I will pause in writing them down as quickly as I have them, but there's still going to be the ideas there. And I can't imagine a time where I would ever, before I die, just cease having ideas. And so I do very much, I think, get eventually the feeling of a log jam yeah. where too many ideas have built up and I do have to release some of them or new ideas can't sort of get through. So they're very much in my creative process is a sense of that I, I want the connection and I want my ideas to be seen and to touch people and connect with people through my ideas. But also I just have so darn many that I do need to get them out on paper um, so that I don't get the log jam. <laughs> So a couple of things that struck me there. So you said not until you're about 15 or 16. So what was it? Can you trace back what kind of made you move from, you know, you said you'd always kind of told stories, maybe in play, you know, maybe uh, in that way. But as a teenager, w was there anything that, oh, I'm going to start writing these down or I want to start writing these down or it's possible for me to start writing these? What, what changed to make you want to put it in a you know, tangible form, as it were? Well, so I was skipped grades in elementary school as a child. And so I was actually going off to be a freshman in college at 15 going on 16. Mm, okay. And so when I hit college, it opened me up into sort of a whole new world of sort of geekiness. I went to a very geeky high school. But so in college, I encountered LARPing and I uh, encountered a play by email right. uh, role playing game. And I also encountered for the first time when I went off to college fan fiction. And I, I didn't necessarily write fan fiction myself, but all of those sort of different aspects were looking at taking creativity and and running with it in a way that when I was in high school, it was very much more sort of like, well, you may have ideas in your head, but the books that are on the shelf at the library, those are very separate from you. Mm. And I didn't have a sense of how one would become one of those books at the library. Mm -hmm. And then when I got to college, I had a window into all these different hobbies that maybe they weren't books on the library shelf yet, but they were definitely taking their ideas and expressing them in a big way. Hey, kids, let's put on a show. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Being being finally surrounded by people who were like, yeah, no, we don't actually need permission. We're just, <laughs> this is yep. what we do. Yeah. <laughs> And the other thing that, that struck me is you said that something to the effect of you're always going to want to tell your stories and, and have your ideas to connect with people. Expand on that a little bit. Why, why is connecting with people and in particular through your fiction, why is that important to you? Why is that a, a drive perhaps? 
Well, <laughs> I, I may get a little bit meta here. Please. In that I have always found, I have some extended family who are actually have therapy training. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the aspects of therapy that you can do is to tell a story and then that allows the listener to find what they need within it as opposed to giving advice, which is simply like you give advice and the person decides whether it's true or false for them. And so I had had that infiltrating into my brain a little bit as I was growing up. And so as I grew up, I sort of saw the power of stories and using them to touch people mm -hmm. and sort of, you know, my friends, um, you know, somebody where I thought she should break up with her not great boyfriend. And so I tell a story of a relative's uh, divorce right. and that relative and how he made the decision and what he talked about later about how he wished he'd made the decision earlier or later or whatever. And so I wasn't giving my friend advice about what she should do about her boyfriend. I was telling a story about my relative and his divorce. Um, and the funny thing about that case in particular was that she got out of it entirely different than on what I had said, because I was telling this story sort of to be a little bit about kind of young love and how great that is, but it does eventually end. And my friend, what she heard was me telling her, yeah, this boyfriend, you know, you're never going to be with him forever. So you're not really in love right now. <laughs> <laughs> and it was very interesting to find that difference between what I thought I was saying and what she heard. And I view fiction to a certain degree. It's like I'm telling a fun story and people are going to have fun. But at the very core of it, I view it as that sort of therapeutic storytelling writ large. Yeah. I'm telling the story about a dragon and a heroine who doesn't quite know what to do. And I'm putting it out there. And my hope in my heart is that somebody is going to read it and maybe I'm telling the story and I think that she should, the heroine should not go with the dragon. I think she should stay with her daily life. But, you know, some reader reads it and thinks, you know, the next opportunity, I'm going to take that because this cool story about sort of opening yourself up to possibilities. Yeah. So you, you let it out there into the world and people maybe take the opposite of what was in your mind when you wrote it and, and run with that. But that is just, I think the, the magic of it for me is that you could put it out there in the world and maybe somebody would take something from it. And as I say, like, I don't expect that, you know, my silly little space opera where they zoom around on spaceships is going <laughs> to, you know, touch every person that reads it, but maybe one, maybe one. And that, that would be amazing. This is something that's come up uh, a few times already speaking to people. The idea that, first of all, we might have an intention with our fiction. You know, there's there's what happens in the story and then there's what the story is about, capital A. And wonderful if those themes and things are communicated. You know, we've done our job, but it's a collaborative thing between yourself and the reader. And you might not reach them in the way that you had intended but they're still finding new meanings. Oftentimes we'll get feedback, I think, where a reader is like, oh, you know, I, it really resonated with me when your character did blah, 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 because that's exactly like, and you're like, wait, that wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't the motivation I was going for. That wasn't the message, but it resonates. It, it rings true. And to me, that's, that's like closing a circuit, you know, that's mm -hmm. okay. Now the work is actually done. Someone else has experienced it and drawn from it their own. They've made it their own in a way. Have you ever experienced a situation? Cause this happens to me almost with every single story and it might take a couple months. It might take a couple years before I go, Oh, <laughs> I was trying to tell myself something there. <laughs> and I, I'm just starting to figure it out, but there it is uh, all over that book. I wrote three years ago. <laughs> Has that ever happened to you? Sure. I think the time when I noticed it the most was that when I sort of, underwent the shift from traditionally published to indie published being a hybrid author. There were a couple books out there that were very much in the vein of what had been traditionally published. I just sort of kept doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then there was a bit of a break where I wasn't publishing too much. And then when I came back and I was sort of doing it in a different subgenre and a different sort of format, 
in that break, what sort of happened was one of my critique group calls it your, your heart book um, Uh or sort of like writing from your heart. Mm -hmm. I learned to get more in touch with that. And it means being a bit more vulnerable, but it also means that sometimes you can sort of recognize a little bit more sort of like, this is what I'm telling myself at this time. Yeah. And even recognize it maybe a little bit more at the time as opposed to later, which uh, of course, when I look at my earlier books, I'm sort of like, yeah, I, I can see what was going into that. But for me, that process of getting a little bit closer to the writing and being more vulnerable with the writing Mm -hmm. is sort of admitting to myself that this is kind of what I want to say about myself and to myself. And maybe I put more of that onto the page because it will create a more resonant product for readers versus feeling like that'll make me too vulnerable or people won't want that and keeping myself farther back so that maybe only a little bit of that leaks through when I don't quite mean to. Mm. So that's sort of been, it's a little bit more of an uh, experiment. And certainly some of the reader reaction I've gotten back about it has certainly been that my writing has been different. And I don't know if it's necessarily sort of more, more alive or more resonant, but I do feel that in my writing process that I try to feel and then capture that aspect of this is what I would tell myself. Yeah. Well, I think it comes back to that old saw that specificity is universal. The more, Mm -hmm. you know, this is why a a biography of someone whose life is not at all like our own will be so popular because, well, there's just another human being who is suffering, being challenged, overcoming challenges, all the things that all the humans always experience, right? <laughs> you know, and I, and I, uh, I, I think there's great, great value in vulnerability when we're writing fiction, because those are the feelings that you, you, you know, the best if you're able to actually face them and, and express them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it, it makes the empathetic experience much more uh much more viable much stronger you know because sure. because readers can sense it you know i i remember i was working my way through a novel a novel that i was writing not reading um and it was i had deliberately set out to address something very personal and of course as it went on i realized okay it's actually about this even deeper thing and some of these writing sessions i mean i think a lot of fiction writers would agree and maybe maybe you'll agree as well that you know, basically writing fiction is like doing a one person show uh, and you're playing <laughs> four or five, six, seven different <laughs> roles and flipping yeah. in and out. And if you really know these characters, you are feeling what they're feeling and, and going through it because it's all it's all some facet of your own self. Right. Mm-hmm. And I had finished a particularly grueling, challenging, but ultimately rewarding writing session. I was fucking exhausted. And I just wrote a little something in some, one of these Facebook groups on writing, who knows which one it was. And I'm like, uh, writing is hard, (laughs) you know, and I I went into a little bit more detail and, and more than a few people were responding with like, you know, if you're not having fun, the the reader's not going to have fun. I'm like, Oh, Oh child. Oh, (laughs) (laughs) Oh dear. That's just, uh, okay. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Because I really, I just, I really uh, strongly, that's a hill I'll die on. I think it's, it's just the opposite. If you're not pushing yourself, if you're not going through it a little bit, then, you know, you're, you're just kind of coasting and the readers will, they might not notice, they might not care. And there's a place for that, you know, every book sort of being very similar to not just in terms of like, oh, here's that same plot again, but, uh, but similar in, in effect, right? Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. Candy. Right. (laughs) You know, and there's a place for that. Absolutely. But uh, I think when we're able to push a little bit further, if we're able to challenge ourselves each time, everybody benefits, including ourselves, of course. So the idea of of working in these these connected stories, uh, this is near and dear to my heart. Uh, I call it just story worlds or personal franchises. And as a, a, a childhood 
comic book reader and uh, getting tremendous excitement when like I read Tarzan books and then I'm like, oh, he goes to the Earth's core. Wait, the Earth's core is a whole <laughs> other thing. And there's all these other books. And, you know, when authors would do that sort of crossover stuff. And of course, Elric of Melnoborn and, and the eternal champion that uh, Michael Moorcock wrote with his various different heroes, all kind of connected or even uh, early Stephen King, where you're like, wait a minute, this rabid St. Bernard is in a town that's just down the street from Salem's lot where the vampires <laughs> live. <laughs> you know? So, yeah, my ears always perk up when I hear another writer working on that. Tell me a little bit about how you approach, I mean, did it come about organically or have you sort of designed a universe or talk about that? To a certain degree, there's there's two sets of them. And talking about this, I won't sort of hide it. In my day job, I'm a professional archaeologist. Right. So that sort of feeds into my writing. So the, the one of the universes um, has archaeology sort of at the very, very sort of bottom base level as far as like it's my science fiction universe. The planets have been around for a long time. And so they have a lot of cultural history with each other. I'm thinking about like how empires rise and fall and, mm. and sort of all that basic stuff that wouldn't necessarily show up a ton on the page. And so that one, it came about organically because I was sort of reaching for the feeling of it's, it's a big universe and there can be sort of individual kind of like couple planets or a planet here and there that are doing their own thing, but maybe they share some technology or language or sort of diaspora that occurred mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. the other ones. And so I would, reach for that to get the feeling of time depth yeah. in the, in the new stuff. And then the, the short fiction connected worlds, those, it felt very much for a while. They're like, I would start an individual story and it would put out tendrils and it would reach back towards the other ones. Mm. And I think that was specifically because I enjoyed making a world that I felt like I had something in particular to, to say about it, not just the characters and the particular character arc that was on the page for that one story, but the world in general. And so with my short story worlds, they're often post-apocalyptic, but post-apocalyptic uh, three, four centuries on. Oh, yeah. So we're not talking about uh, Station Eleven where there's a generation that still remembers the world that fell. Yeah. The world that fell is far out of living memory. And for me, the reason I wanted to build this world was because there's an idea that I play around with a lot myself, which is that I, as an archaeologist in 2023, look at the past and people who lived in 1500. Mm -hmm. I live near Seattle. And so I'm looking at sort of the uh, indigenous people sort of around the West Coast of North America and some of the Euro-American people sort of into the 19th century. Um, so a hundred years ago, maybe several thousand years ago, what was their life like? Yeah. Um, what don't I know about what their life was like? What are the gaps? What are the holes? What are the things that I'm making guesses and I may be wrong? And so I say, okay, imagine that in 2400, somebody is looking back at 2023. Yeah. What are their guesses? What are the holes? What are the things that are wrong? Mm -hmm. um, and that grew a little bit out of there are often jokes about how, you know, archaeologists, if they don't know what somebody something is, they say that it's uh, sacred uh, or, right. yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, oh, well, we don't know what this was used for. So it was used in sort of some sort of religious ceremony, which I entirely disagree with. And so to say that somebody from 2024 or um, 2400 is looking back at 2023 and not saying, oh, well, that's ceremonial and that's ceremonial and that's ceremonial, but making like decent guesses and getting some things wrong. And we know they're wrong because we're here living it right now. That is so interesting to me. I just, I <laughs> love it. It's <laughs> crunchy and great. <laughs> and so I love to put my characters into the situation where they're walking around and experiencing the remains of our world now. And they have different opinions about it. Sure. 
And how deep do you go? I mean, we know, obviously we know 2023, but how much of the interim time have you sort of worked out? Just broad strokes that get filled in as you're writing a, a, this story or that story? Or have you kind of, how deep is your world building, I suppose? <laughs> I, I'm somebody who doesn't like to do a ton of um, I've just plotted out intricately 300 years. Mm -hmm. um, I like to have the sense of some stuff was happening in here, but I'm not going to necessarily pin it down in a big way, um, except to the degree that the intervening time does change how people look back. Because I'm very aware of, you know, somebody of a Northern European background who is sort of doing research on um, Native American people. Right. That that changes my perspective in a huge way. And I Absolutely. need to listen yeah. Yeah. all the time to indigenous perspectives on that. And so I always ask, are these characters, are they looking at their ancestors or are they looking at other people's ancestors? Uh -huh. Because that changes a huge way. So to that degree, I need to know, OK, have people sort of moved around are these people who are looking at the world now in my story, have they, did their ancestors come from somewhere, somewhere else or did their ancestors, have they been around here for a while? So I do figure out that much, but that's sort of the level of where I want to get the perspective and get into the heads of the characters. But I don't really care too much about, well, there was a government of this and then they right, fell. And yeah. They from this year to that year and from that year to this yeah. year. And yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm very similar. I, I, I work in right now focused on one story world, which is ostensibly a, a fantasy setting and another that is more modern times into, well, late 20th century and, and then into the future. And so one is, you know, earth and one is not very much not, you know, uh, uh, it's the fantasy setting is, is not some sort of hybrid made up version of 400 or 500 years ago. It's a different world, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I take a similar approach because sure, I know in broad strokes what happened on this fantasy world working backwards, but it's mainly so that the names of the cities make sense and the, uh, the ethnicities of the different people make sense. And, you know, but why are these folks worshiping a certain God and not the other one? And why do these people hate those people? And the big broad stroke stuff when it comes to the cultural stuff, I, I admit mm -hmm. uh, it's a, it's a, far too tempting form of procrastination uh, <laughs> to, to get into things like, well, let's make sure that the, I, I know all the wind currents and I know where the rivers are and blah, 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 blah you know, sure, yeah. <laughs> uh, you can go to as, gr as granular as you want, uh, anything to not write. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I, uh, yeah, I, I share, uh, I think a similar approach because I like having those big, broad strokes where sure this important thing happened this many years ago but i don't know all the people involved i don't know all the details that's a story to be told one day i don't need to work it out now mm -hmm. i yeah. just need 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 my folks to you know if they refer to something that to them is is the deep past or the mythic past <laughs> i'm informed enough that the verisimilitude is is convincing in the actual writing mm -hmm. And since you have this perspective as an archaeologist and as a speculative writer and a, and a fantasy writer, the, the thing about how, generally speaking, right, technology seems to move exponentially, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, our first, whatever it was, uh, 500,000 years, not so exciting, uh, <laughs> you know, and then bada bing, uh, we're off to the races, especially in a fantasy setting. I don't know how you feel about this, but it's always bothered me that like everything is in millennial scales. Like this was the thousand year war and, <laughs> you know, for 5,000 years, these, come on. <laughs> when you think about, you know, everything that has happened in the last 2000 years and even in the 2000 years before that, it's like how, 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 how do you deal with the flow of deep time and how quickly things happen? And, and, you know, you mentioned outside of living memory, but things are still influential. What's your, what's your approach there with your, when, when you're looking at this from an, from an archeological perspective, if, especially since your characters are, it sounds like some archeologists or at least directly researching or investigating past events. Well, actually my, my characters, I do tend to make them just normal people. 
Gotcha. Because I, I like the idea that normal people are walking around and they're seeing the remains of past cultures. Um, and to a certain degree, they don't care. Gotcha. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And that's how it would be, right? Oh, that's just yeah. that mound. <laughs> yeah. My example is often um, Chaco Canyon, mm. um, which uh, people who live in the American Southwest sometimes have heard of it or have visited it. But um, it's one of the lesser sort of visited parks as far as the national parks. Mesa Verde is often visited more, but when you look at the sort of research in the past, Mesa Verde was probably less important politically to the political systems of those times than was Chaco Canyon. But just it, Mesa Verde it happens to be a point, park that people like to look at. And so uh, if you're not in the American Southwest, if you're you know going about your business in like Ohio or somewhere, you've probably never heard of it yeah. and you probably don't care. Right. Because it's just something that other people might go to look at because it's neat. Um, it doesn't affect your life. I think that's that's a great perspective to remember because, yeah, uh, most folks, unless something is like directly challenging them or affecting them, it's just that thing over there. And I think that's sometimes a, a weak point that I see in other people's sort of like far post-apocalyptic stuff is the idea that we would always long for the past. Right. And, and to a certain degree, like, I think that humans are generally aware of their past. And if you get kind of a cultural discontinuity where particular culture has died out, you're only having outsiders looking in on it, you might sort of forget it. But people like their current lives and they yeah. want to better their current lives. And there's only a certain percentage of people who are going to be like, well, I wish I was living back in the Roman Empire. Wasn't that so great? Can't we go back to it? Um, a lot of other people are like, well, no, I would like to live in our current time and also make our current time even better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If anything, there's a lot of short term. The grass was greener 20 years ago kind of stuff. But 200 years ago, I think people are very selective. Like if they do say, oh, I, I know I, I wish I was born, you know, in Roman times, they're not thinking it through. <laughs> they're, yeah, they're thinking maybe, I don't know what they're thinking about. They're, they're romanticizing it, literally. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't want to, to live in Roman times, but you, no. you were talking about um, millennia. And I think that one way to approach that is to look at, you know, elves or something. Mm -hmm. um, Tolkien, certainly his time scales always did sort of make sense to me because we can feel it around us today. There's a generational sort of just resistance to change, Sure, you know, Always coming up through academia, mm -hmm. um, you know, people who published a certain idea in the past, some of them can get right on top of and get going home about new ideas, but some of them, you kind of have to get rid of the old guard in academia for new ideas to come in. And it's just because they learned it in their childhood, they expanded upon it in their you know, prime of life. And then when they're older, it's harder for them to let go. And so the idea that there are these unchanging elves that the harder to let go period just lasts a really, really long time um, always made sense to me. But the, the other aspect of millennia is that when you look at human history, for one thing, like we always have to get rid of the idea that like the technology is getting quote unquote better. Right the technology is, is changing. Yeah. And the reason that it's changing is because there's so many people that we couldn't support them mm -hmm. without making the change first to agriculture and then to industrialization. But if you go back before that, there were sort of long periods of time and we don't know kind of what the mental culture was doing at that time. All we have is a little bit of the material culture in terms of say stone tools. Mm -hmm. um, Cause not a lot of other stuff preserves from that far back. Right. But there does seem to be a long time where the material culture was reasonably similar. And it, to me, it seems very much sort of like we got to somewhere that was working pretty well. And that was something that we could continue to keep up and live that way. And live as hunter gatherers and have a lighter presence on the landscape and gather in small groups and tell our stories and just sort of keep things going that way. And so when I see something of a long time depth, if it's more of a, for millennia, we were in smaller groups and we used our magic to preserve our histories and to move over the landscape and to sort of 
I buy that in a bigger way than if it's sort of more like, no, we had agriculture um, and we had war, which sort of suggests that maybe there was some resource stress, which is sort of a, you know, anthropological term in terms of there wasn't enough food to feed our people. So we got to go yeah. raid the next people next door. And so that puts pressure to say, well, okay, we don't have enough to, to feed ourselves. And so we're going to get it from the people next door, or maybe we can try a different method of farming and maybe that will feed more people. Um, and that is putting the pressure to, to develop. Mm-hmm. Challenge, challenge breeding innovation. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. And so if you're talking about thousand year war, that would be, I would also agree sort of like, why were we, we stuck there for so long? <laughs> yeah. But sometimes I can turn that part of my brain off. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you about the elves, but on the same front, they're still living in a world where the sun rises and sets every day. What the hell are they doing? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> how many songs can one compose? And <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, I mean, but anyway, that's more of a pet peeve. But but with the world building stuff, especially in a fantasy setting, yeah. It, it, you know, I when I was working out my Shapers World stuff, I deliberately like really compressed things because they're not industrial, but I could see where they would get there. Mm -hmm. You know, and it wouldn't take 10,000 years from the point where they're pre-industrial, you know. Mm -hmm. So let's shift gears a little bit. Sonototem is sort of focused on three pillars of focus, uh, making stuff, finding success as we each define it and staying healthy and sane in the process. How do you define success for yourself and where do you feel like you're at in relation to that? Mm, How do I define success? I like the feeling of having something that I'm working on, having some kind of goal. And I have learned through hard experience that, you know, it doesn't do to have a goal of I would like to have, you know, 10,000 readers right. or, or something like that. But you want to make the goal of I would like to release a novella and then stop there because you don't know how many people are going to read it, but mm-hmm. you can control whether you release whether it or not. Whether they're able to read it or not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I feel most, I think, not happy, but content mm. um, when I have a goal that I am focused on. And it's the type of goal of um, I would like to query a novel or I would like to do a set of short stories or I would like to even, you know, something so simple as there is a themed anthology call. And I would like to submit something to that. And so that I think there's a there's a set of sort of like month to month kind of like this month, I'd like to write the story for the themed anthology call. And this year, I would like to get on top of having new kind of novel and a new subgenre that is more marketable, that is going to be good for querying that kind of thing. Because by some measures, having had the traditionally published contract, um, one could say that I have already succeeded but yet, you know, I want to continue to grow my career. Mm -hmm. And so looking at ways to grow it in different directions since, you know, the one series, it didn't take off traditionally published. Where do I go from there? What different directions do I go? Did you get the rights back to that series? I haven't. And that's been a decision that I made that I know is unusual. When I first sort of went into the indie publishing space, my traditionally published series was urban fantasy Mm -hmm. and I could really double down on urban fantasy and try to make my name be big in urban fantasy in the publishing um, circles. And to do that, I would want to get the rights back for the first beginning of books and do all the marketing and the promo and make the first one free maybe, and like do all that kind of stuff. Um, And I made instead the decision that I would go, a different direction away from urban fantasy. And so in that case, how I view it is that my publisher continues to ship the eBooks and I continue to have that cover art and, you know, all that sort of stuff that people recognize Mm -hmm. from when it was first published. And that can continue to hang out and be there. Meanwhile, I'm putting my focus into my science fiction series. And I don't know that it would be particularly helpful to be doing some promo with my first urban fantasy novel 
to advertise my science fiction series. So I did make the decision. And, and I know it is on a, an unusual one to leave the rights with my original publisher for, for now. I'll, I'll never say never. Eventually but. they'll be yours, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Do you see much crossover of readers from that urban fantasy series? Are you finding that there's fans of you, the author, who will who will absorb whatever you put in front of them? Or is it pretty much siloed between your particular subgenres that you're focused on? It has turned out to be less about genre and more about uh, format. Because looking at my um, statements from my traditionally published series, I was a little bit unusual compared to some of my friends who have, like, say, an epic fantasy series, had a higher percentage of ebooks versus print when they were traditionally published. I had a very high percentage of print um, in comparison to many of the people I've heard speak. So I think that what happened was that it was hard because. I do have a print edition of all of my eBooks that I'm doing for my mm-hmm. science fiction series, but it's a little bit harder to find because it's probably not going to be on a shelf. Right. It's probably going to be something that you go to the counter and say, Hey, could you order this for me? Yeah. Versus the traditionally published book where maybe it's going to be on a, a few shelves. Right. And so I think that what I probably lost was my print readers. Mm-hmm. And it's not because they would hate my science fiction. It's because they do not know it exists. Right. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's a little frustrating, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and I can like do ads on Facebook or, or Amazon or whatever. And I suspect that what I would be reaching at that point are, are people who are very sort of online mm-hmm. and maybe tend to have a tendency to be a little bit more ebook oriented. Yeah. Um, though I definitely do have, plenty of readers who say, I'm really glad you have the print edition because even though I'm online all the time, I do like to relax having yeah. a print book in my hands. Yeah, of course. So, so how long ago were, was, let's say, the last uh, of that urban fantasy series? Um, so the last traditionally published one came out in 2014. And you're still on bookshelves. <laughs> no, seriously. Um, that's, that's, if, if so, that's, that's pretty great. <laughs> when, a, a few, a few bookshelves at this point. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you know how it is, you know, the, the, the first book gets a particular print run and then the next book, no matter how well the first book sold, they look at returns mm-hmm. and the second yeah. book always gets a smaller run. The third book, a smaller run than that. So yeah, no, that's great that these things are even still in print. Congratulations. I think, Oddly, number two is the one that's still in print and number one has gone out of print. And I don't understand my my publisher's uh, decision making process there. Why not keep number one in print longer? Um, Strange. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the used book economy um, is very useful. Right. Because uh, ebooks mean you're never out of print and the good uh, used book economy means that extends it as well. That's true. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Writers who are opposed to the secondary market, they still pop up now and again. And I'm always confused by that because first of all, you know that as a child, as a budding writer, before they even knew they were going to be a writer, they were probably a reader and they probably got a lot of stuff at used bookstores. So just pay it forward. (laughs) (laughs) And, and it's the same thing. Those, those used bookstores are helping keep your, uh, your, your, your reaching readers one way or the other. And, they're going to come around Mm -hmm. just in terms of day to day, not maybe not necessarily actual technical writing process, but patterns, rituals, habits, practices. How do you stay healthy and sane while trying to, to to sort of pave this, this writerly life, uh, this path while also holding down a day job? Walking. Actually, I think it's if we're talking about not just process, but sort of like keeping myself sane. Mm -hmm. I like to say that I'm like a YouTube video in the early days of the Internet that um, I have to buffer before I write anything Uh or it's going to be really choppy and uh, hard to watch. And where I buffer best, you know, you, you can hear writers talk about that they get great ideas in the shower or washing the dishes or, you know, whatever. And, and I do get some of that, but my very best sort of like a gold standard ideas come when I am walking. And so I think the best thing I ever did is to incorporate a couple daily walks into my day so that not only am I getting the all the benefits of, 
you know, movement and moderate exercise and, you know, all that sort of thing. But it keeps my ideas flowing and my creativity working. Mm-hmm. You know, even if I'm not going to be on that particular day, going to be able to sit down and put fingertips to keyboard, having the practice of walking every day as much as I can, you know, mm-hmm. life gets in the way. Oh, sure. It keeps that that flowing for me. And I think keeps me sort of feeling more balanced and more healthy. That's great. And it's interesting because, well, of course, the big example, right, is taking this to the extreme, uh, Kevin J. Anderson, who dictates mm. Everything he <laughs> writes on a walk, you know, he, he's out there two or three hours every day wandering around. And that's that is his process. And it's 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 how he stays healthy as well, I would imagine. But yeah, no, clearly, I mean, walking. I mean, there even is walking meditation. You know, it's 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 that keeping the body just busy enough that the mind can go elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and and you're you're still taking in consciously or not, you're still taking in the, this stimuli from all around you, you know, uh, while those unexpected connections might bubble up. Mm-hmm. And you said a couple times a day. Is, is that a morning before work or uh, during lunch or how do you squeeze them in? Yeah. So it's a, it's a before and after work in the pandemic. My job took me to work from home. Sure. And I know a lot of people that's great for, for me, I was reluctant and I definitely see its benefits, but I'm not wild about it because I do miss being around people each day. Yeah. But what I definitely wanted to do is I, I never commuted by car. I commuted by transit. And then there was a little bit of walking either to or from the transit stops. And so when I went to work from home, I knew immediately that I needed to kind of replicate that somehow. Yeah. And like it came after later, I was started reading these articles that are like, if you're newly working from home, it's really good to have some kind of like demarcation between home and work. Mm -hmm. And one way to do that is sort of taking a walk or something like that. And I was already doing it because I'm just like, I can't be shut in for that long. I need to do that. So replicating a commute, I do a quick walk before I sit down to work in the morning because I think resets my brain. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. And then I do a longer walk in the, the evening slash afternoon. Um, and that tends to be the more creative, the more taking different interesting routes or, you know, whatever to sort of play with ideas kind of walk as opposed to the morning is very much more the sort of like, all right, I got to be at the morning meeting in 15 minutes. So right, I got to walk right. fast, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what about the actual sort of writing life? Do you experience anything in terms of like imposter syndrome or keeping a regular schedule or how does that work for you? Because this is something that I see again and again and again talking with folks is there's kind of figuring out how you work best. Mm -hmm. What does that mean for you? I will preface this by saying like having had these sort of conversations with, you know, the writers around me because I'm part of a community, which is also very valuable. I, I think I'm somewhat different than the usual in that the routine of it is not difficult for me. I am a routine oriented person. Mm. They say about, you know, pet cats or whatever that, that they really like routines that I, I am a pet cat. <laughs> <laughs> I like to write at similar times of day. And when it's time to write, I sit down and I do it and it's not too tough for me. But I think that where I've had to do my growing and figuring out and that sort of thing is picking up and, and going beyond writing similar things. Because if you think of uh, writing like a decathlon, you know, the, and there's the, the sort of the old thing about first you have to start writing and then you have to finish it and then you have to revise it and then you have to actually show it to somebody else and then you have to actually submit it. And, and each of those, if you think of those as something that you have to do to win your medal in the decathlon, it, some people like they, they need the medal for having made word count or they need the, the medal for having finished an entire novel and not got distracted on another mm-hmm. project. What I need the medal for is, I think, the learning process of trying out new ideas and not just sort of being like, well, I wrote an urban fantasy novel and I submitted it and it didn't go anywhere. And so now I'm going to write an urban fantasy novel that and 
So clearly some learning needs to happen there. Like what was it about the last one that didn't hit with with readers or with, you know, agents that I was submitting it to? What about this new idea from the outlining phase is going to be different? Mm-hmm. And so that's where I feel like I do my hard work and my learning process um, and less so the like, I'm not a huge word count person, but I am a endurance marathon person as mm-hmm. opposed to a sprinter. Hmm. So I do about 1200 words a day, say or four days a week. Yeah. So, you know, do the math there and that, that gets you sort of my, my annual input. Yeah. So that's not hard. So if you say, Hey, Rian and write a hundred thousand word novel, I'll say, okay. See you next back year. In. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and so a lot of the sort of like NaNoWriMo and that those sort of challenges where what, the person is working on is getting themselves past the hump of, oh, it's really hard to not get distracted by something else or whatever. Yeah. Th- that's not my, my point that I get distracted. What I need to do is say, okay, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to write a hundred thousand word novel, but I am going to think really in a focused way about how to make this be the most marketable novel that it's going to be. Or, Maybe I'm going to say, like, I'm throwing marketability out the window. I want to get in touch with writing a different genre. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to do something totally different and I'm going to let myself be totally unmarketable. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to really, really learn this new genre in this new novel. And so I'm going to do something different. And so that's my challenge versus the sort of like, did I make 1200 words today or not? That's interesting. And it it gets into the, the idea of genres the last few people I've talked to have been, as I admit to being, resistant uh, or even hostile to the idea of genre distinctions. <laughs> <laughs> but it sounds to me like, and I'm reminded of the Orson Welles quote, the absence of limitation is the enemy of art. It sounds like you're looking for deliberate constraints as a challenge. Yeah. This year I've been doing a lot with the specifically psychological idea of play. And play continued from childhood into adulthood. Mm -hmm. Um, And I first started sort of thinking about it when I was having conversations with people that say video games don't necessarily meet the psychological concept of play because you are trying to meet a goal and do some things. And we say that it's playing, but there are uh, consequences. Like you can't beat the game or you can't progress in the story if you don't accomplish this goal in a very particular way in uh-huh. most cases yeah, yeah. and boxes aside. And the psychological concept of play is much more that you are trying things out in the absence of consequences mm-hmm. so that you can just do fun, interesting things and not feel like if you do them wrong, then something bad will happen. And so that frees you to, to try different things and try things that you never thought of before because you're not going to ruin anything. Yeah. And so that's in some ways different than the, the idea of limitations because it's sort of like, well, you're throwing out all limitations. You can do whatever you want. But I think that it is for me within limitations because I try to separate myself from the idea that this novel is going, going anywhere. I'm not thinking, Oh, I'd like this agent to read it or these readers to try it. I'm right. thinking this novel, I'm just going to write it and it's going to be interesting and it's going to be a challenge. And then I feel like the, the limitations are more sort of the toys that, that I'm playing with. I give myself a bunch of paint colors. What can I do with these? Yeah. What can I do with these? Mm-hmm. And then I just go to town. And so for me, the, the limitations don't feel like limitations. They feel like toys or like paint colors that I am experimenting and playing with. That's cool. Yeah. And so I know you mentioned something um, along the lines of why didn't this urban fantasy work out? I'm going to make the next one, you know, figure out what that was. And I interpreted that and maybe I'm misinterpreting, but as really understanding the tropes, hitting all the notes, is that kind of what you meant? Because what happens when, you know, you, you take those toys but some of them are Legos and you make things that, that <laughs> might that might uh, <laughs> that might go against the expectation of that uh, that genre. I think that's the, the hard part of all of it 
Mm. Um, because honestly, I left urban fantasy as I feel like the tropes really began to to ossify and it was harder to do new different things within them. Mm-hmm. And I feel like it moved out of the traditionally published space into the indie space where it's still going strong. But I feel like the tropes got very rigid mm-hmm. and very confining. And the people who are still within the tropes and have been the entire time, like it works really well for them because their readers know what they're going to get and they get it and it's great. But I think that part of feeling out the tropes is uh, having a really earnest, deep conversation with yourself being, do I want to write in these tropes? And if I don't want to write in these tropes, do I want to nudge or sort of pull this genre towards the direction I want to go instead? Or do I want to break out and go somewhere else? And some of my exploration process in writing has been discovering that in that particular case where urban fantasy had become pretty rigid in its tropes, I I eventually decided that no, in fact, I didn't want to pull it in one direction. I wanted to break out and do something entirely new. And that's, you know, up to any particular author and whichever tropes speak to them or don't. Yeah. And I had gotten some advice on some of my past urban fantasy novels about here's how you could make it fit the tropes better. And I just really reacted really, really strongly against that. I'm like, no, <laughs> I don't want to do that. That doesn't feel right. Yeah. Ultimately, you have to serve the story and yeah. yeah, not not the imaginary maybe reader. I mean, it's like what you're talking about before is you can control what you write and Pretty much that's it. <laughs> you, know, you can control yep. writing it and getting it out there where people can find it. But so as an indie author, and it, it sounds like you're still, you know, submitting and still open to traditional opportunities, but as mm-hmm. an indie author, how do you, you know, when you are straying from these, I say this in the most loose manner possible, but these formula, how how are you reaching readers when you can't quite describe it as this thing or that thing. That's a tough one. And I will say I'm not speaking from a position of being like super successful in the indie space. I would never want anybody to be like, oh, well, she advised to do this, that or the other thing, but it didn't work for her. I'm not advising anybody to do anything because <laughs> no, 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 it didn't no. work for me. No. Um, but for me, it was much more a process of looking out there and saying, of the, the categories that I'm seeing that readers do identify with and are drawn to, which of those am I drawn to? Mm-hmm. And can I go right in that? Mm. And maybe sort of if I'm using, say, a tropey space opera plot, can I then do my world building underneath that? So um, I've chosen something that I still do like but it is a trope that readers will recognize. So I'm writing to that. And then also I'm putting in, you know, something else that's my own thing that is what's drawing me. Even that is so like space opera. Like, what does that mean? Does that mean Peter Hamilton? Does that mean (laughs) star Wars? You know what I mean? There's, there's Mm -hmm. such a range. uh, And, and yeah, it's, it's a challenge. The balance between writing what you're, trying to write and figuring out which of those predetermined boxes (laughs) you should at least (laughs) toss your ring toward, you know? (laughs) Yeah. And I feel like I did some stuff for a while there where I just went wild with downloading Amazon samples of different indies because I wanted to put myself in the shoes of a reader who logs onto Amazon and they're like, I want something to put on my Kindle. I like dragons. And so they type in dragons into the Kindle store and kind of see the the deluge that comes at them. Uh, Yes, (laughs) yes, yes. And also (laughs) having then downloaded these samples and tried all these samples, just the experience of saying, I know that I want dragons and I typed in dragons and I downloaded 10 samples and I liked maybe one of them Mm -hmm. and not enough to buy it. And it's not because those nine, 10 were bad. It was because those nine or 10 are not for me. And so I think it gives me a real empathy for the reader who logs on to the fire hose. Yes. And is like, I want to find some dragons. And I'm like, I Rhiannon, have a dragon book for you, reader. But how can I let you know 
without you having to download like 300 different samples to read mine, which you, who would yes. do that, right? Who has preach- time? I, I dedicated an entire episode of this podcast to how to fix that very problem and it'll never happen. But, uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, because right. How does that one person who, you know, uh, that one person looking for a dragon book, who you know, would, would your thing would be right. How do they get past the lit RPG and the reverse harem and the, all those other things that are, that have been stuffed with the keyword dragon mm-hmm. Because yep. it might be a dragon. Uh, yeah. How do they get past it? Over the years that you've been writing professionally in one capacity or another, thinking now, what's sort of the the one overarching or primary lesson that you think that that you could summarize? What's what's the bumper sticker version of of what you've learned <laughs> since you've been <laughs> since you've been able to call yourself an author? Oh boy, um, that's a hard one. I feel like I should I should leave a little like notes to my my past self or something like that that go into these sort of things um i think that uh what i might say and it wouldn't necessarily apply for everybody of course not um but learn to trust your instincts once you have forged your instincts Mm -hmm. because i have found success with where i have found the stories that resonated on some deep sort of unconscious level within myself and and brought those out but if you do that i feel like too early at the beginning without thinking about what you're doing then you can get sort of unfortunate like unconscious bias Mm -hmm. and sort of like weird underground stuff that's like percolating down there that you weren't quite sure (laughs) it's just left over from childhood the example I like to use is that I grew up and in school we had the D.A.R.E. program, you know, just say no to drugs, mm-hmm. which has been thoroughly disproven. <laughs> right. Maybe it even increases drug use. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so if I was to reach down into my unconscious, I would not be surprised if my unconscious would offer up some kind of like magic is like drugs. And so you just need to say no to magic kind of story. Mm-hmm. And it wouldn't be because I believe that it's that black and white that you should just say no to drugs, Mm -hmm. but that's in there. And I kind of know it's there because it was installed in childhood (laughs) 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 against my wishes. Right. And so if I was just sort of reaching and I'm like, okay, I want a cool magic system, but it has to be dangerous and (laughs) it's going to wreck people's lives and they're going to have to say no to it. And if that came out on the page, like, I don't think I'd want that. If I hadn't sat down and interrogated and thought about what in my childhood might make me think that like, oh, magic is so dangerous and I'm going to say no to it, that I might just sort of like bring that up and there it is and there it is on my page. And so I think about what's there that I don't know is there yet Mm. and how can I sort of like push that aside so then I can get down to the real resonant themes and just emotions of my life. And so over time, I feel like I have learned the skills as far as like getting in touch with what's down there, but also interrogating it and saying, where did that come from? Do I want to use this as it just comes to me? Or do I want to change it up a little bit and think of some different ways of going about it? And so that's the trust your instincts, but make sure that you know what's making those instincts first. Right. Because our, our minds, our brains are going to do everything possible to keep us safe, mm-hmm. uh, including keeping us from new ideas or breaking the status <laughs> quo or looking too closely at this thing or that thing that might cause, you know, metaphorical, emotional pain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. And, and I think it, it circles back to what I, you know, sort of glibly said earlier, you know, always asking why. You know, mm-hmm. don't, don't accept that first impulse because yeah, it probably is your, your subconscious just being lazy uh, <laughs> because that's just biology. Uh, we, <laughs> yeah, the, exactly. the, the less energy we can spend, <laughs> the more our brain is like, good, 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 good job. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yep, exactly. Well, that's fantastic. This has been a lot of fun. Anything you wanted to add or, or comment on that's come up in the course of the conversation? don't think so. We've covered some really interesting stuff. I'm glad to hear that. I, I, uh, I had a great time 
And uh, Rhiannon and Held, thank you so much for being on Sonatotem. Totem. Thank you. Hey, if you've enjoyed this or any other episode of Sauna Totem, I've got three things that I would love for you to do for me to help show your support for the show. The first thing is, if you haven't already, wherever it is that you get your podcasts, please subscribe for free to Sauna Totem. Just click that subscribe button for Sauna Totem wherever it is that you might have heard this episode, wherever it is you get your podcasts. Next, wherever it is that you get your podcasts, I hope you'll take just a moment to rate and review Sauna Totem. Tell the world why you enjoy the show and why other people should listen to it and subscribe for free. And finally, if you'd like to go the extra mile and you have the will and the means, I hope you'll consider becoming a patron of Sauna Totem and my other creative endeavors. For just $5 a month, not only will you be a member of the Multiversalists community of writers and readers and creators, you will receive all kinds of special access, perks, and exclusive content, not least of which is the uncut, unproduced edition of every episode of Sonatotem. Just go to mattselznick.com slash b-a-patron or visit patreon.com slash mattselznick and pledge just $5 a month to support the show through your patronage. That's it. If you can do one or two or all three of those things, you'll be really helping the show and helping me reach more people with the Sonatotum mission of making stuff, finding success, and staying healthy and sane in the process. Thanks. Folks, if you enjoyed today's episode, if you enjoyed the conversation with Rhiannon Held, who again, you can find over there at rhiannonheld.com on the interwebs. I do hope you'll consider leaving some feedback. You can simply go to the show notes for this episode, which you can find at mattselznick.com slash sonatotem-077. Or you can send me an email at matt at mattselznick.com. If you would even like to record a little voice message, maybe on your phone, you could email that to matt at mattselznick.com. I respond to every comment on the website. I respond to every email I receive. And if you send me one of those little audio messages, I will play that in a future episode and respond there. And we'll have sort of a time shifted conversation. I want to mention that the conversation that you heard just now between me and Rhiannon Held was only two thirds of the whole thing. We spoke for over an hour and a half originally, and my multiversalist patrons, which you heard about in the little interstitial break there, my multiversalist patrons, one of the benefits of being a multiversalist is they get the complete, uncut, unedited version of every episode of Sonatotum. So if you'd like to hear the entire uncut conversation, 90 plus minutes between me and Rhiannon Held with lots of additional content, do consider becoming a Multiversalist member patron for just $5 a month. And speaking of the Multiversalists, every episode I like to thank the existing $5 a month and above patrons. So thank you once again to Chuck Anderson, Amy Bowen, J.C. Hutchins, and Ted Leonhardt for your continued awesome support. Next episode is a focus on making stuff, one of the three pillars of the show, making stuff, mostly writing, finding success as we each define it, and staying healthy and sane in the process. So next episode, we'll be talking about making stuff, and I will have some listener feedback to respond to. Once again, I, I really enjoyed the conversation with Rhiannon. I hope you got a lot out of listening to her perspectives and her experiences. And I hope you check her stuff out. And yeah, we'll do this all again uh, in a week. My name is Matthew Wayne Selznick. Take care.